Good evening. Good evening and welcome to everyone in the room and to the many hundred of people who have kindly joined us online. I'm Justine Kane, the group CEO of Diabetes Australia, and I'm here tonight to introduce the second of our National Diabetes Week, Great Debates. These debates are part of the work we're doing to spark Australia's biggest conversation on the impact of diabetes in Australia. Tonight, we're focusing on the challenges facing diabetes research in Australia. Before I begin, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands on which we meet and pay my respects to elders past and present. We recognise their connections to land, waters, winds and culture. We pay the utmost respect to their cultures, to their elders past and present, and we extend that respect to the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders people here with us today. Diabetes Australia is committed to improving health outcomes for all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people affected by diabetes and those at risk. I'd also like to warmly welcome all of our panel members here tonight and my wonderful co-host and moderator, Dr Norman Swan, AM, producer and presenter of Radio National's Health Report and a multi-award winning producer and broadcaster. Welcome, Dr. Norman Swan. We're delighted to have you with us. I'd also like to introduce the wonderful Associate Professor Sof Andrikopoulos, CEO of the Australian Diabetes Society, the accomplished Professor Alif Nikichi, Director of the Australian Centre for Accelerating Diabetes Innovation, or ARCADI, and Dame Kate Campbell Fellow at the University of Melbourne. Associate Professor John Wentworth, a well-known endocrinologist and researcher at the Royal Melbourne Hospital and Walter Eliza Hall Institute. Professor Mark Cooper AO, head of the De Diabetes Department at Monash University. As I think you can hear, we have a, an excellent um, group of distinguished researchers with us. I'd also like to very warmly welcome the amazing Renza Shabilia, who lives with type 1 diabetes and is a leading advocate, a former employee with Diabetes Australia and the current Director of Community Building and Communications for Global Access with JDRF International. I'd also like to welcome some of our distinguished guests in the room and those online. Online we have Dr Michael Stanford, the Board Chair of Diabetes Australia. In the room, Gordon Bunyan, Board Director of Diabetes Australia. Online, oh, and sorry, also in the room, I was going to say who for last, but then you'll think I've forgotten you. Glenn Noonan, CEO of Diabetes Victoria. Online, we also have CEO of JDRF, Mike Wilson, and the Chief Scientific Officer for JDRF, Dorota Powlack. So we are amongst a very illustrious group of people. Thank you for joining us. As many of you know, in 2021, we marked the 100th anniversary of the discovery of insulin. Before Frederick Branting, Charles Best, James Collop and Jake, John McLeod made their momentous discovery, diabetes was a death sentence. In the years since then, we have seen a range of research breakthroughs transform the lives of many, many individuals living with many different types of diabetes. From the early technology breakthroughs to the latest generation of diabetes medicines, research has changed how long and how well people live with diabetes. And very importantly, research creates hope. Hope that one day we will indeed find a cure for all types of diabetes. People living with diabetes deserve and need that hope. And we need to give hope also to our world-class researchers. Hope that they can secure sufficient funding that is absolutely essential to supporting the work they do to save lives and change lives. We have world-class researchers in Australia, but the investment in diabetes research is falling. And it's falling even as the number of people living with diabetes increases. 
we need to change that. So tonight we're here to unpack how to support, support and sustain a thriving diabetes community. This is absolutely crucial. We need to protect the long-term sustainability of research and very importantly, the long-term sustainability of our healthcare system. We need to find a way to reduce costs as well. So I'm gonna start with what I know is gonna be a firecracker of a question with a more firecracker of an answer. And after that, Dr. Norman Swan will take over. But let's get this going. I know it's going to be very, very interesting. So I'd like to start with you. Is Diabetes Australia, uh, is Diabetes Research in Australia in crisis? And, and let me just answer it by saying that Diabetes Research is not in crisis, it's actually on its deathbed and it's about to expire. Uh, I can tell you in numbers, because I'm a numbers kind of person when it comes to these kinds of things, that um, research funding from the NHLRC, which is our major body uh, for funding medical research in Australia, has decreased by 50% in the last decade. Uh, I looked the other day at the MRFF uh, funding since the MRFF started, I think, in 2019. Uh, diabetes funded projects were about half the amount that cardiovascular research has received, half the amount that mental health has received, half the amount of infectious diseases received, and about a quarter of the amount that uh, cancer research has received. Diabetes research has been completely underfunded for the burden of the disease. There's 1.5 million people, Australians, living with diabetes in Australia, about 1.3 million with type 2 diabetes, about 140,000 people with type 1 diabetes. The trajectory of diabetes, has in, people who live with diabetes, has increased 35% over the last uh, 10 years. The funding for research from the NHMRC has decreased by the same amount, 35%. It is... Terrible. Absolutely terrible. So you think it's bad things, <laughs> Um But let me play the devil's advocate, sticking with Mark and John. I mean, it's a competitive grants process. Best ideas win. Yep, the NHMRC is in dire straits. It's got, what, a 17, well, it's even less than that now, 15%. 10%. 10% success rate. That doesn't mean that 90% of the applications are crap. It's mm -hmm. just that the 10% get through. But a problem with diabetes researchers that their ideas aren't good enough to actually make it into that last 10%. Present company excluded. Well, I think um, it's sort of a vicious cycle. If you stop getting the grants, the standard of the research decreases. The people that are attracted to the field decreases. So the quality does decrease. I think diabetes overall, I'm just doing reviewing brands at the moment, is still not one of the worst categories of research in the country. There's no question the immunologists, the infectious disease, particularly as a result of COVID and cancer, are probably the strongest researchers in the country. There's no question. But let's say compared to cardiovascular research, I would say as a group, we're actually stronger scientifically, yet we still get less than that. I might get you to put that on your lapel. I think it's just, it's, it's on your collar there. That's what I'd put. Yeah, just, yeah. Um, so, well, John, I mean, do you agree? Well, um, to some extent, I mean, I think probably part of the problem is that, you know, our numbers are dwindling. And um, numbers know, of researchers. Numbers of researchers. Um, and, you know, the critical mass is shrinking. You've got to remember that these grants are. Uh, although they're sort of adjudicated by our peers, our, our, if our peers primarily come from cancer or immunology, they're going to give the grants to cancer and immunology more, more commonly. That would be my expectation. I haven't run the numbers, but I think, um, you know, part of the issue here is that, yes, we've got a great base and we've got a great tradition and great history, great people. We, we need to jazz this up. We need to bring new people in. We need to find, make it exciting. We need to nurture the next generation so that we can build up 
uh, and, and really, you know, fulfill our potential. So I'm not asking you all to self-flagellate, but Ellis, what's your view of this? Because you've got to, you kind of got to accept history and understand the history. That's, I don't know why that noise we made, but I was going to blame Mark, but it's not Mark. Uh, right. It's like a noise on a Zoom thing. You don't know actually who's making the noise on a Zoom call. But this isn't a Zoom call. Um, well, it is for those of you watching this camera over there. Um, Ellis, yeah. your, your take on this context, because what we're really talking about today is a rebuild. Yes, and I, and I agree. Um, I think the, the things that we're missing out on, we don't have a cardi cardiovascular mission that is guaranteed full of money, like $50 million that Michael has committed. We don't have a diabetes uh, mission, which um, limits the pool. Um, and not talking about an HMRC, but their market, which is highly relevant uh, to this discussion. And then the other issue, I think, is the, you know, we really have to nurture that next generation of researchers. So that's what I think that I'm worried about that keeps me up at night is who's going to, you know, keep continue keep doing this. And we need to work together to enable us to do that, I think. Um. So let, let's just then double back. But before I do, Renza, as a person living with type 1, what are the research priorities? Before we start the rebuild, what, what are we rebuilding to? I think there are so many which could be part of the problem. And I will answer that, but I just want to touch on one thing that I... You've had journalists, you have media training. You know, to say, you're the question. And then, yeah. <laughs> answer your question with a question. No, I'm not going to do that. But I am going to say that one thing that we haven't touched on that I think does contribute to this is the image problem that diabetes has. And this is one of the things that I hear when I'm speaking with researchers is... And, and anyone, there is this idea that diabetes, and we'll put this as an umbrella, I know that there are different types, I live with type 1, people live with different types, but there's this idea that diabetes is a self-inflicted condition. And this bias that we have about, well, how worthy is it then for research dollars to go towards that as compared with something that people couldn't have done anything about is probably also a contributing factor that we need to think about. So I just wanted to pose that. But to answer the question... Well, it's, it's just oh. it's sort of there, but that's an important... So what you're saying then is somehow we've got to do something about stigma. We absolutely need to do something about stigma. I'm sitting up here and I will just say with incredible researchers who I've worked with, who I've known, who I'm, you know, I'm delighted to be working with the LEAF at the moment. And, um, and I'm a person with diabetes. We don't have a single behavioural researcher up here who I think could really contribute to a, con a, a discussion about stigma because stigma for those of us living with it is a day-to-day -day thing that we have to deal with. It is paralysing at times. How do we understand yeah, what that means? One. Absolutely with type 1. Absolutely. There are aspects of type one that are that are highly stigmatized, and we hear that all the time. Yeah. Okay, you've got that off your chest, but it's, <laughs> and I'm not demeaning at all. It's a really important question, which yeah. I'll come back to later, because in some senses, it's a marketing problem, a marketing problem to kids at school, university, science degrees, medical degrees, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Yeah. But should it succeed, what are the priorities that aren't necessarily in front? You've mentioned behavioral research. Yep. What else? I think behavioural research, and I asked, you know, my research looks like this. I go to Twitter and I asked yesterday in a tweet, what are the research priorities for people living with diabetes? And there are a number of things. People absolutely want a cure. Of course we want a cure. We deserve a cure. We should not have to do this every day of our lives. Um, but the majority of people said that they just want things to be easier, that they want there to be more mental health research to understand what it is the daily burden and how to be better at that, how to deal with that burden better. Um, we want People were saying that they wanted more research into technologies that make life easier. You know, as a person living with diabetes, and I am one person, so I need to declare that I'm one person and an incredibly privileged person with diabetes, but every day what the hope for me absolutely is a cure one day, but it's every day that diabetes will be a little bit easier. So the research that goes towards that is, is what we're looking for. I'd like to agree. Oh. Just to make it a debate. You can, no, it's meant to be a debate. Yeah. Oh. So I wanted to say Australia is a relatively small country. If we're going to try and do research in diabetes, we really can't cover everything. So then we've got to decide what would we do. That might be that we do behavioural research or we do technology research. But in general, what Australia's done very well at 
is what they're strong in, and that's what they keep doing. Can and I just ch ch challenge you on that? Because mm. if you look at, at cancer research in Australia, it goes the full spectrum yeah. from psycho-oncology, it goes through the full cancer journey. Yeah. We don't go through the full diabetes journey, yeah. really. We try we don't to- have people. We don't have enough people to do all of that. But, but shouldn't you aspire to do that? Well, the problem we've got is, and uh, I think Elf's a good example here where this is the problem that you have, is that you get these big grants, but then you have to distribute it among big teams and you end up, you cannot compete against groups like in the US. So, for example, the small... That's okay, that's okay, because that just means people collaborate more within that, you know, those... Yeah, but then you don't end up doing transformative research, which is really what the people here need. If you're going to cure type 1 diabetes, you need to transform the research. Whatever's already known, you can call that important because it's translational and it's clinical adaptation of what someone's done in Europe or America. But what Australia historically has been very good at, for example, the seminal work that the epidemiologists did in the South Pacific and worked out the boom of diabetes from the Zimmet and all of them, was transformational. What Len Harrison and the others did in Weehai in the immunology of type 1 diabetes, but this is not being maintained. And that's a pity because immunology is one of the cardinal strengths of Australia with Nobel Prize winners in the area. But if we decide, no, we're not going to do that anymore, we're going to go and do just technology where Medtronic's is spending a billion dollars a year on technology. And if we're lucky, the NHMRC will give us 20 million. That would be a lot. Then you've got to decide, yes, it's important to do technology, but a country of our size where diabetes is a limited area, we have to do what we're strong in, and we don't have the young people coming and being trained in what we're strong in. We're not attractive enough for them. And this is where I think JDRF has a very important role, which they were achieving 20 or 30 years ago. The number of young fellowships that they were giving to people to do was a lot. I don't know. Do you have the data now how many fellowships we're getting in JDRF compared to 25 years ago? I don't think we're getting as many. Maybe you know, Helen. Do you know? I, this is the problem. It's so, not, that's what I'm saying. So I'm, I'll come to soft. So soft, I mean, this conversation suggests that we move away a bit from investigator-driven research to a more strategic approach. Um, you know, that's, uh, you know, red rag to a bull sometimes. Thank you, Norman. No, I'm trying. And I realize I'm on a panel here with invest your curiosity-driven researchers. Um, the only way we will be able to cure type one, type two, any form of diabetes is by doing foundational discovery research. We need to understand how the medicine works. We need to understand how the immune system responds. We need to understand what affects uh, insulin secretion, and, and so on. And that's basic science. In Australia, basic science, when I refer to science being uh, on its deathbed, it's basic science that, that it's on its deathbed. And let me just put this into perspective for everybody. As a scientist, I have been trained for all my life to do research in mice, in rats, in cell lines, whatever it is, right? Uh, and I've been writing grants and I've been putting together a, a program to try and to understand the ideology of type 2 diabetes. That's me personally. If I lose my job, if I don't get a grant and I lose my job, there is no fallback. My kids will starve. Uh, I don't have money to pay the mortgage. I am absolutely dependent on this grant to come up. I don't think anybody realizes the stress that goes with doing basic science research in Australia. If Alifa Kinchi tomorrow, if everything sort of falls apart, she goes into private practice, she goes to private practice and is an endocrinologist and can make a living. If John Wentworth, if if, if Tia hits the fan, he goes into private practice. A cruise ship doctor, actually. A cruise ship doctor. <laughs> you don't want to do that these days. For me, for me, if it all goes downhill, there is nothing. There is no backup plan for me. I have to find another job. So 
am I good enough to do? And you ask the question, maybe we don't write me grants. It's a good question to ask because that's what the health minister said to me when I went and met her, the previous, previous health minister. And she said to me, well, maybe you're not good enough. And I said, maybe that's true. But that's, that's, that applies to a lot of people with diabetes research. And if you look internationally, we are very well recognized. You go to the American Diabetes Meeting that we did last week, mm -hmm. and Aussie researchers are all Everyone. over the place. We have an outstanding reputation. It's just that the pool of funds is very limited. We just touched on it. The NHMRC funding rate, it's not a success rate. It's woeful. It's 10%, the funding rate for all disease areas. Diabetes last year was at 5.2% funding rate. That is appalling. We were promised when the MRFF kicked in in 2014-15. But just for the consumers in the audience who yeah. might not know what this is, this is the Medical Research Future Fund yeah. funded with a, a foundation grant. So there's a guaranteed amount of money and it's supposed to be for translational research, although there's been probably a bit of pork or anything going on with it. It's been a political, uh, so a political. That's quickly we have got the oil. So I think, I mean, the other thing just to throw in there is that you've got to make the point that a 5% funding rate really means that you're spending a third of your research time right. writing grants. Right. And that that's just a shocking waste of time. And, and I think that's that's that sort of needs to be put out there too. I think, um, you know, we need to do something about that. I think the issue is, I think this is where we need to bring everyone together and actually um, come together as an alliance and say, Followed examples of what cardiovascular people did. They've got guaranteed pool of money every year, $50 million towards cardiovascular and stroke research. And we it's really hard for us to get it because it, it actually says heart disease and stroke. You know, whereas diabetes causes um, those complications. So a third of people in hospital were consistently shown have diabetes. It's heart, 50% of heart failure admissions have, of people with diabetes. So, so it's 50 million from MRAA. 50 million every year. So we haven't done the you guys haven't done the initial groundwork that needed to bring that together. You know, that's the that's what we have to, as the you know people who are coming up, have to face with. But I think there is an opportunity now to work within organisations coming together to try to get that in and, there because there is funding in there. And, and we should say that uh, DA with the ADS and the ADA put in a pre-budget submission in in February, January, February for a national diabetes research alliance and a task force so that we can all come together to be able to uh, provide a path. Yeah, like the absolutely. Alliance. I mean, we've got people, the, the biggest cause of blindness, the biggest cause of end-stage kidney disease, heart failure, 50% of hospital admissions. So we're not dealing with one of the major causes of disease, of chronic disease. And and that's that's a failure from, you know, both our ends and also the recognition of other genesis of disease. Well, I'm going to do some workshopping, uh, you know, mass workshopping. We'll get questions from the audience shortly, but <clears throat> on what a strategy might, a research strategy might look like, because that's how you get the pot of dough, is that they feel there's a strategy there that, you know, how are you going to spend the money with what benefits, even if it's sometimes with other specialties, not this one, a bit of bullshit. But we, um, let me ask about philanthropy, yeah. because one of the roles of institutes in some ways. If, if institutes justify their existence, they have a philanthropic sum of money sitting there, which smooths out the bumps in your grant life. Yeah. So yes, you live, live or die by your grants, but this idea that you, I mean, one of the things I always talk about, you know, in being in science broadcasting for many years, is I can't tell you how often I've interviewed somebody about you know, a breakthrough. I never use the word, but you know, they've had a breakthrough. And then you say to them, well, how, how did it all come about? Say, well, you know, I thought I had this new idea, but I was doing a literature research. Do you know that 30 years ago, somebody had exactly the same idea? And, then, and, and of course, nobody knows why it never went anywhere. Why it never went anywhere is the grant ran out. Yeah. The postdoc left, went to Stanford, another body went to Singapore, and the whole thing died. That's what would have happened. So, this continuity. So do we not have, should we be having, should there be a role for more diabetes research institutes, which can smooth out that funding? I mean, you sit in the hall, which has always supported, well, for many years, supported mm. 
fundamental research in diabetes. Mm. But, and that helps there, but should we have a Victor Chang for diabetes more or more of them? Yes, I think that's a very important point. And in actual fact, having been at the Baker Institute, which was originally a cardiovascular institute, and then merged with diabetes, we thought this would be a great opportunity to have a really strong diabetes centric institute. But unfortunately, it's an interaction between diabetes and cardiology, and that hasn't been as good as we hoped. We actually, as a group, do quite well in the philanthropy. We have actually, when we established our Department of Diabetes, even at Monash, we got quite a lot of philanthropy, probably primarily due to Paul Zimmet and the way that situation. And I, we still get philanthropy. But the problem with philanthropy is it's very geographical. So that if you're at Monash Medical Centre or in Broadmeadow, it's much harder to get significant philanthropy than living in the eastern suburbs of Melbourne or Sydney. So that's one of the problems with philanthropy, that it's very um, geographic. And diabetes is a condition that unfortunately affects poorer people. So well, it's type it's not two. particularly type 2 diabetes. So that's an issue. Type 1 diabetes, I think philanthropy has been very good. JDRE is essentially philanthropy. Um, that's how it works. The problem has been that it's a very complex interaction with the research. But is it really philanthropy as opposed to, because some of the funding is from federal. But worldwide, JDRE internationally, it's mostly money from wealthy American parents. Children with type 1. So there's, even in Australia. There's, there's your community. And that's one of the things that's missing from this conversation is where is the groundswell of community that contributes to this? Because if we look at where we've been successful in, um, you know, for example, policy change, it's because we have a groundswell of, of advocates and people living with diabetes making noise to make things happen. The success that you're talking about is because it was families generally of kids with diabetes saying, hey, this isn't good enough. You know, there's a hashtag that we use in the diabetes community, we are not waiting. And that was specifically used when a bunch of um, people directly affected by diabetes, people with diabetes and parents went, hey, the technology that's out there can do what we want it to, but they're not letting us do it. We're not waiting. We'll do it ourselves. That is the story of the diabetes community making things happen. So one of the things that I think is missing from when we're talking about research is how do we actually mobilise that community to be part of this conversation? How do we mobilise the community to be writing to local members about research? You know, They will write to their local members in a heartbeat to get better funding for for a CGM or for FIAS when it's being threatened to be removed from the PDS. Look at how that happened. I, I agree with you. I think and yeah. other organisations look at diabetes and go, oh, look at these. They're so organised. They've actually got all the CGMs funded, like people, colleagues from nephrology and, and so forth come up. And, but I completely agree with you. And it, and it's all around co-design, working with people with the disease. Exactly. And, and, and you know about that because that was the Akadi was built from the ground up with that. We were talking about this before ground yeah, you can do you can do you know transformative research with that in mind with, with the end user in mind from the outset. That's so so if you if you look at research diabetes research funding, it's the NHMRC, it's the Medical Research Future Fund, and then uh, JDRF does a little bit. Diabetes Australia does a little bit through the Diabetes Research uh, Program, which is terrific, of course. And then, and then, and then nothing. So the philanthropy, the donations, the, the sort of those bequests, that, that sort of private is really missing for us. We don't have it. We don't have it to the level that's required to sustain us when funding it comes a little bit uncertain. So I agree with you totally. We need to work a lot harder on all of those, work hard with the government to boost NHMRC MRF funding, work hard with JRF to ensure that they fund the best projects, work hard with Diabetes Australia to support them, to get more donations bequests. Uh, if anybody's out there, the yeah, ADS will take your money as well. <laughs> so let's, let's just now workshop the strategy, the pitch. Yeah. It's like the grew and transparent. The, the pitch. Um, you're going for 75 million from the MRAA. Every year. Every year. 
That's what you're going for. Now you've got to convince me that it's going to be well spent. Mm -hmm. yeah. And what are your priorities? Yeah. How, what, are, what are you going to do with that? Because I'll be giving you that, or the MRF, because you're saying this is dying in Australia. It's a huge burden of disease. You should be doing more for it than you are. OK, I, I accept that. But I actually haven't got a clue how you're going to spend that money. So what are you going to spend? What are the, what are the research priorities? What are the research infrastructure things that you're going to do? Let's build up the strategy and we'll get a contribution from the audience as well. It's oh. perfect time now because they're actually reviewing the MRFF um, grant funding and the way it's distributed. So this is actually the time. To stop to, barreling. To, to, <laughs> yeah, to actually write letters yeah, and to write their submission. And there's also the parliamentary inquiry that's happening to start these up. Money. So two things happening. So this is a very strategic time where we should be working together and saying, this, you know, we need we need to try to get together and actually ask for the 75 million every year, guaranteed. And part of the MRFF is that co-design. It's actually about people's, you know, it's it's more translational. It's more about lived Okay, okay, it's, it's a good argument that we should be doing something. I'm well, trying to get you to be tangible yeah. about. Okay, I'm I'm on the interviewing committee if there is one. Convince me that you've got a strategy to spend the money. What? Let's just workshop a strategy. So, John, you have well. I mean, I think one thing, one little bit of infrastructure or a facilitator we're missing is good data. Um, on, on good data on what's going on out there. I mean, we can't... So epidemiology or...? Well, systems to allow us to get our hands on data sets that represent people with the problems we're trying to deal with. Um, and, and, you know, it, it is woeful. I mean, it's not just a problem we face. It's, it's a problem across the board. Um, but, but we're, you know, we're not particularly well set up in diabetes at the moment. So is there a registry? Is there a type one registry? Oh, well, there is, but it's been defunded. So there's the Adam registry, but it's sort of on its knees now. Um, and uh, there are other things that people are talking about bringing up. But, you know, th that, that's, that's a disaster. We don't, do we have a similar sort of ability to, to, get type 2 data. I mean, we've got these various state and federal data sets that are impossible to link up. They're impossible to access sometimes. Um, can't really help us so we'll, well, understand what's going on. Let's just talk about data for a minute. I mean, I was talking to somebody this morning, um, in, in, I won't say which, but in a, in a Raj Hospital service in Melbourne, and they're trying to integrate. So I said, well, you're using the Lumos system from Melbourne, from Sydney. So the Lumos system is in Western Sydney particularly, very focused on diabetes, and it integrates general practice data with hospital data, exactly what you're looking for. Oh, no, we're developing our own. WTF? Well, I mean, really? Yeah, I agree. That's a big problem in Australia. Yeah. Everyone is trying to reinvent the wheel. It's really very old-fashioned thinking. So there, there are, so okay, so data in some shape or form, but the... But this is where we can use the My Health, you know, ID. We've got a national, we've got an ID that we can actually use that data. If government, uh, you know, people can actually access it and for research purposes, and I know some groups are, uh, we can actually use it, link it with various data sets. But we need more people using it. And I think mm -hmm. that that's one of the problems yeah. is that, you know, a lot of people are terrified by it because it is convoluted. It is difficult. If English isn't your first language, it's a real challenge. People are suspicious about it because they don't understand mm. what it works. It sort of feels like that whole piece of, hey, how do we make sure that people want to use it and understand it, why it's good and why they would want to and what it will give them, but more how it could be used for research See, to improve I, things. They don't, that wasn't. I bet you, if you add it up, the money spent on data in diabetes, and I, I appreciate it's almost all in type 2 rather than type 1, so I understand that. You should, there should be more in type 1. But if you added it up, PHNs, GPs, hospital systems, it would be a bloody fortune. Hmm. And it's not being used properly. No, it's not being used. And so, um, yeah, you know, it's, it's not simple to be able to get all that together and allow people to use it. But that's that's a but critical... The countries do that really well, is it? The Swedes do it. Scotland. Yeah. 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 Okay, so, there's a, so there's, a, there's a data piece in there. I mean, I think, you know, I think we need to clarify your question a bit. I mean, if you're saying it's $75 million of the MRFF, what you're really saying is, you know, we're going to give you money for translational research and, and you know, you're going to be thinking about what 
clinical outcomes you're going to achieve with that. Now, that's important and, in, and that's great, but as, you know, Mark's been alluding to and Soft's been alluding to, there's this, you know, this piece below it where there's a lot more basic fundamental research, which that sort of money probably isn't going to touch and, um, you know, is, is important if we're thinking 10, 20, 30, 40 years ahead in terms of where the next sort of, you know, when the next discoveries and sort of iterations are going to come well, from. Well, okay, let's broaden it up. Yeah. You're making a pitch. It's the same pitch whether you're doing it to MRFF or you're doing it to um, philanthropy uh, around the place. It's you know, hard work. You're out there all the time trying to find uh, money, but it's the pitch that you know what you're wanting to spend the money on. So there's a data piece. Elif, what else? I think our clinical trials is really important, and we're trying to establish an Australasian um, diabetes clinical trial networks and bring everyone together so we can actually do more homegrown clinical trials as well as attract more clinical trial activities. So I think that's really important. So give me an example of a clinical trial you would want to do that would be funded by a drug company. Is there any would number? Oh, it's, we mean yeah. people would, would not. Okay. Well, we're doing one at the moment, which is funded by an HMRC, which is using flash with post monitoring and Aboriginal trial data on the people. So that's you know that's that's one that wouldn't be funded by drug companies, but actually is a very important and group of people who need this technology. You know, it's actually really helping them. That's just an example. There's platform trials that are you know are coming up uh, from you know sort of both behavioural as well as um technological. Uh, Things, yeah. Trials that compare. I mean, you know, trials. You, you know, no, no two drug companies going to come together and exactly. put their drugs against yeah. each other. Um, you know, we've got, you know, you know, these sort of real, real world research type setups on platforms and the like, where you can try to understand, you know, which drugs work best in which people if you've got the systems in place to record early phase trials. They're not going to front early phase trials. The local discoveries that are made here, they're not going to. We, you want to be able to actually do those early phase trials here and say, look, this is what we've done. You know, this is what the basic scientists. So, can you do early phase trials if you haven't got the basic research, presuming producing your molecules? The basic research is important, but it, it may be repurposing. It might be, um, you know, other, uh, you know, it might be technology. So, there's early phase trials. That are when we want to something else, you want to talk about what other trials? Well, I was just going to say, for example, it's really what John indicated. So, one of the big issues in type two diabetes now is what are the best drugs to use. The companies are not going to do it against each other. But one of the big issues in type 2 diabetes, we've got transformative treatments like GLP-1 agonists. We're going to have dual and triple in the future. And we have the SGT2 inhibitors. EBS system says you can't get them together. But it might turn out that's the best treatment. And a great trial would be to give one group a GLP-1, one an SGT2, and one both. And you might turn out after five years, the ones that got both have no renal disease, no strokes, no heart disease, that's not going to be funded by a drug company, but that would be an extremely important clinical trial. For example, there's another trial that's now being considered. We don't really know how in type 1 diabetes how to intensify all the risk factors. So we have a STENO2 trial. You mean the risk factor management? Yeah. yeah, we did blood pressure, glucose, whatever, lipids. We've never done it in type 1 diabetes. It turns out JDRF and Steno in Scandinavia are interested in doing such a trial. Wouldn't it be great if Australians could join in? This would be a high quality trial. We wouldn't just do the trial, we would do very clever biomarkers, super technology. We've got a lot of other options, maybe behavioural concomitant research. Oh, you're going to have behavioural now, are we? We right. definitely need behavioural. I'll just put, in, in the look of there being someone up here, I yeah. will say we definitely, for Absolutely. everything, because we, I mean, the second we start talking about things that are actually going to then actually make a difference to people's lives, Absolutely. do we know that people with diabetes are actually going to want to do that? Mm. That's got to be built into the research that we're doing. So... Do you have a seat at the table at the moment? I should have a much better, better one and it shouldn't just be me. I mean, it absolutely shouldn't be me. There's an incredible advocate called Chelsea Rice from the US and he says if there's not a seat at the table, drag one up. And I say drag one up and drag three others and bring your mates with you because we can't have – I'm delighted to be here, but I'm one person with diabetes. I have type 1. Where are the type 2 voices? And I think that – while, you know, this is Renza in full flight about community <laughs> engagement. You do it properly or you don't do it at all. But absolutely, people with diabetes, 
Tom Robinson from JDOS says, we don't need a seat at the table, we are the table. And that is exactly what it should be. This affects us directly. We should be part of the conversation. And I don't know the details of what you do, but I'm fascinated and interested in it. And so somehow people like you have to, and I know you've got so much time, get better and explain to me why I should be excited. Tom K told me off because I told him that I was sick of rats being cured with diabetes. I'm not a rat. I'm not a mouse. I've been to Disneyland. I wore little rat ears and I still haven't been cured, but he told me I had to get excited by it. The reason why? Yes. Because the fact that you've got all these insulins today, the CGM, yes. the insulin pumps have, has come from basic science. SGLT2s, the GLP1s, were a direct result of basic research. We have to tell the story better. Right? So, so I appreciate everybody, what everybody says. Mm -hmm. It's terrific. But at the end of the day, like I wanted to say before, and I'll reiterate, if I don't get funded, I lose my job. And that's yeah. the end. And the, no one's going to come and rescue me, which they didn't. No one came to rescue me. I lost my job. I'm fortunate that I've got this role as CEO of the Australian Diabetes Society. I lost my job. Now, mm. you could argue that I wasn't good enough research. No, that's, that's not true. Yeah. If you give me 75 million, I'll tell you how I would spend it. <laughs> the, floor is floor. the floor is yours, so. The cause, <laughs> 30, 40 percent. I was going to say just before, like, um, an important point is people with type 1 diabetes are not, like, the all the transformative changes we've had in type 2 diabetes, it hasn't involved type 1 diabetes. Right. Right. So, like, those medications that have really stopped diabetes people with these progressing and, and all the complications that haven't been done in type, people with type 1 diabetes. So there is also a need like it. for people with type 1 diabetes. We would like it. That's fine. So my colleagues here have done a wonderful job, database important clinical trials, behavioural research. I'm going to take you back to the beginning. And the beginning is what fundamentally causes diabetes? Type 1, type 2, gestational, monogenic, LADA, you know what causes diabetes, and that's what we need to know. Right? What causes diabetes? Any form of diabetes is beta cell dysfunction, the inability of your beta cell, your pancreas, your beta cells in your pancreas, your other beta cells to secrete enough insulin, and that's what causes diabetes. So, if you gave me 75 million, I would invest it all in understanding the underlying cause of disease. And I think a very good example is, let's say, lipid lowering. So lipids have almost been, in treatment of LDL plus technology, worked amazingly. Everyone said you could use diets, diets drop your cholesterol 5 10%. Now we have drugs, we have people that have been given, that have defects in the LDL receptor, and then in the PCSK lines. This was all from fundamental research, uh, identified these abnormalities, Nobel Prizes, whatever, and creating amazing drugs. I've got a patient of mine. He was the first patient to get a stat in Australia. He had a heart attack at 24. He has the LDL defect. He was treated with originally the statins. We imported them from America in Australia. He's still alive now. He's 68. Now he's on a PCSK9 inhibitor. His cholesterol is two. It's transformed him. He has survived a condition that had an average survival of 45. This is probably what's going to happen in diabetes too, but we're not testing them. We're not doing that sort of research to find the individual with a unique form of diabetes that will produce a magical drug. Turns out PCSK9 is a very rare cause of cholesterol, but it turns out you can give it to anyone and the cholesterol goes down to one or two. And diabetes is even better one. ones, but even better ones like okay. glycerin. Yeah. So what I'm saying is, what Sop's saying is that it's the biggest discoveries are usually fundamental level. There will be other discoveries that will be very important too, but we don't have enough support of the fundamental anymore. And I know that 75 million, if it comes from the MRFF, it's awkward to put that into fundamental research. That's the problem. So we've got 50 but it could be the jump start you need to yeah. actually get you on the road. And, and you can invert some um, basic science you know, into those grants, I think. You know. But I think the most important thing we have to do if we get 75 million or we plan for 75 million is to create a new, young, highly talented workforce. And that comes with money because we don't have enough money. People look at diabetes and go, it's better for me to be a COVID researcher or an infectious diseases researcher in general or in, in inflammation or whatever. 
When JDRF was really funding nearly half the research in the country in the early, you know, in the 1980s and 90s, we had no trouble recruiting people to go into research because we could tell them you're going to get a three-year postdoctoral scholarship and then they're probably going to give you another three years advanced scholarship. You've got a secure job. That doesn't exist anymore. The JDRF has decided to go for targeted research and they've forgotten about the value of the workforce. So the people like me and Tom Kay, who were funded in those early years by JDRF, we became the leaders of research. Those people, the young ones, are not getting that opportunity. And that's a problem. And we have, you know, Tony's here, Alfred, head of Indigrande, has got lots of brilliant young registrars that want to do something. We can't offer them security. Whereas if they go into cardiology, it's more secure, and the worst comes to worst. We don't There is an issue also is that there's a huge clinical need. Am I sorry? In diabetes. Um, and it's a, you know, diabetes clinical need. There is yes. a huge clinical need. We've got patients that have been waiting for months to get into clinics. We've got complications happening everywhere, young people. Okay, so we're, we've, got, we've got the shape of something going, but let's yeah, be, let, let, let me be the cynic for a moment and ask John. <laughs> Haven't we solved the problem? We just put semaglutide in the drinking water. I mean, isn't that yeah. the issue? Isn't you know uh, all over Red Rover, John? There'd be a cheaper solution, but that'd be a simple one. Um, you know, I, I think obesity is the elephant in the room um, when we talk about diabetes, and and we definitely need to be thinking about prevention and treatment of diabetes when we think about trying to make an impact on diabetes. Um, but, you know, I think. You know, I'd put some of your MRFF money into some sort of implementation strategy to see with a very simple concept, put a tax on that middle um, aisle of the supermarket, give low-income people a, a card so they can buy fruit and vegetables with the proceeds and just see if we can change behaviour and change body mass index that way as a simple, pretty cost-effective way to deal with a big problem. So, but you know... Type two diabetes, but that's just clarify, mm, right? Yeah, yeah, for type two, sure. Um, but... I mean, and, and some type one as well. Um, and so, uh, you know, that, that, for instance, is how I'd spend some of my money. Um, I, um, you know, there are solutions, of course. There are solutions available coming from elsewhere. You know, semaglutide's a wonderful, you know, success story from a lot of mainly pharma-driven research in the later stages, but, but started academically um, with, with Brooker. And, um, you know, I, I guess other things will come as well. Um, we, we need to, I mean, one of our other great needs is to work out with all these great tools, what is the most cost-effective way to spend our money and, and, and deliver that impact. And that's, I guess, implementation and, and economic research that also I think is very important and should be part of that 75 million as well. But if I was somebody in an Aboriginal community, I would say almost nothing that you've said in the last 45 minutes, well, you could blame me for that. Is of relevance to me in an Aboriginal community, which we are. And I'd say I, I agree with you. So, can you tell me what, what's going to make a difference to you, and and what we should be doing? Well, it comes back to Renz's point: is that the people at the table have to be from Aboriginal communities as well. Yeah, yeah, of course. So, and can I can I say I totally support what you just said, John? In terms of, can we please think about how we can make the healthier choice the easier choice for people? Um, but I, I am always, um, I guess, nervous when we start to, you know, obesity is a health condition just like diabetes is. Yes, there is overlap. They're both so stigmatised. Um, and I feel that one of the things that's an issue with diabetes sometimes is that it gets swallowed up in other research areas. So often when we're talking about obesity and we sort of add diabetes or we're talking diabetes and then we add obesity and it, it confuses things. When we put diabetes in a basket with NCDs, it sort of loses its, you know, the importance of it because there are other non communicable Crossroads for a whole series of other Right, things, exactly. Right? So I think that while it's like when we're having conversations about okay, let's put a sugar tax on things or for that, great idea. Um, how that, what, where that fits in the diabetes puzzle, it's, it's not a solution, it's part of the puzzle, but also we've got to do it in a way that doesn't inadvertently actually add to more stigma that the 
the flow on effect from that could actually end up being more of what we're seeing now, this image problem of diabetes that I genuinely believe is a reason why people, you know, we're talking about philanthropy. It's one of the reasons why people won't put their hands in their pockets because they think it's like obesity and type two diabetes and all diabetes, it's you brought it on yourself. And so messaging is really important. Communication and messaging around this is also has to be part of the conversation about research. Any questions or comments from both the online audience and from the face-to-face -face audience? We might take one from the online audience to start with, Tim, if you've got one there, and then I'll come to you. Yeah, the first one probably, um, just picking up on Renzo's point just there, uh, does diabetes have an image problem with significant stigma and blame associated with type 2 diabetes that perhaps translates to grant funding? Answer that question. Your, your, your answer is yes. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So what... But how do you change that stigma? Because there are ways of doing that. What would be your idea of doing that? There are lots of different ways of doing that. And I think that firstly, we need to hear more from people with diabetes, understand the lived experience. And I think that's a big part of it is we don't hear enough about enough different lived experiences and what it is that we're dealing with every single day to understand that. Um, because I think, you know, there is this blame. It, it, it is, you know, well, you've developed a complication, you brought it on yourself, you didn't go get your eyes checked. You got type 2 diabetes in the first place, it's your own fault because you weren't active enough. So understanding more about the drivers, and I think you're right, the drivers of actually why is it that some people get complications when others don't? Why is it that some people develop type 2 diabetes but others don't? And, and you know, and, and it's all, positive stories as well. I mean, and the money yeah. is on coming because if you look at breast cancer, or the best funded part the area of cancer, it gets better and better. You know, mm -hmm. extended survival and money That's keeps right. on coming. The success breeds success. Yes. Yeah, my name is Gareth Dahl. I'm a researcher at St. Melbourne, specialising in diabetes. I just want to say, I've also brought my lab along that these are the youth that you speak of today. Thanks. Uh, and they're all absolutely outstanding scientists that have made transformative breakthroughs in diabetes research, particularly with Diabetes Australia funding. I just want to say, in terms of MRFF money, um, if you want a transformative slogan, which I point in the important part, is it must be basic research. All the transformative breakthroughs have come through basic research, whether that be the development of insulin, understanding the signal of the body and brain. But moreover, GLP-1 agonist is all about basic research. In my opinion, that is, I'm, I'm completely on soft side here. That's where all the money should come. That's where transformative information comes from. And I just want to put it into context. The leaders of, um, of soft pharma that, that developed GLP-1 and insulin Eli Lilly, Nova Dordis, they come to us regularly and they say to us, Gary, we've got nothing in the pipeline. Beyond GLP-1, we are desperate for mechanisms. And they look to us in Australia for those answers. Yeah. Now, the key thing there is, is we take money off pharma because we cannot get it from within Australia. What that means is that RIP is shared with Nova Nordis, Eli Lilly, et cetera. They take a part of that. And then taking that brain drain, which is the title of today's debate, they are taking that in part from us. But I'll put it in part, what it also does is it highlights the vast potential we have here in Australia, particularly in diabetes research. And I just want to say, it, it, need, it needs to be funded um, from the public. And um, I guess my question beyond my rant yeah. to the, the panel is... Well, they've been ranting, you're allowed to rant. <laughs> <laughs> I guess a little bit of diabetes Australia. So for me, when I was an early career researcher, and again, I brought over, you know, some outstanding researchers here today. A major part of me was the Diabetes Australia Research Grant Program. It gave me my first start. Yeah. It gave me the track record to be able to compete beyond the transformative ideas that John spoke about. It gave me that track record. And I think that is a key element that must be preserved and grown in the Diabetes Australia Program. And I guess the main question is to, to some particular. What are your thoughts around that? Is it, do, you, do you agree with my sentiments? Absolutely, because I got my first go, my first start, Garen, uh, through the, the Diabetes Australian Research Program as well. And I got the, the DARP grant, and then that led to NHMRC grants and so on, and fellowships and, and so on. So I totally agree with you. I think we need to support the DARP grant. I think we need to Sorry. find. Sorry. We need to find more funding for DARP. I think we need more philanthropy, more donations, bequests, 
going to dump any money that gets donated to Diabetes Australia that is untied should all go to the dump grant, all of it, the whole body of it. We need to be able to compete with Cancer Council, with Heart Foundation, uh, in terms of size and, and duration of Diabetes Australia Research Program grants. We're not there yet. Diabetes Australia is putting a, a, a plan together with appointing a director of research and then having a look at the priorities to be able to do exactly what you just said to support the next uh, generation of people through the DAP. Sorry, Tim, any more from online? Thanks. Uh, James Spate from the Australian Centre for Behavioural Research in Diabetes. Thanks for the plug, Renza. Um, Thanks, Jane. <laughs> I would just like to say congratulations on all the transformative breakthroughs. I agree, they've all been in basic research. And the reason for that is that 98% of the funding for diabetes research goes to basic and clinical research. So if you think that you're badly off soft, I'm sorry, but I'm not going to allow you to play on that one because the behavioral researchers are doing it much tougher than the basic scientists, okay. much tougher than the clinical scientists. Now, if you want answers to the questions you've been asking tonight about and the answers indeed to the questions that were being asked last night about access to care and how we improve care, you need to come to the behavioural researchers to find out why it is that people aren't taking their treatments when they're recommended. Why aren't people using the technologies that are being developed? Why are people not doing the self-care that they need to do in public? Maybe it's because of the stares and the looks and the comments that they get. Maybe when they come to see their health professionals, they don't want to be judged for their glucose levels. These are all issues that behavioural research can answer. These are all issues to do with stigma and communication. And I defy any of you on the panel to be able to answer these questions with your basic science. Okay, very easy. We find a cure. There's no diabetes. We don't need behavioural scientists. But is the cure going to be something that people want to do? <laughs> with all due respect, Sol, that's bullshit. <laughs> what? You've got to be... You've got to implement so, what you find from basic research. Should we not? And that's be, partly behavior. No, you should be. Should, should we not be? As far as as find, of course we, we should be. For really? No, no. Are I, we serious? We're not aspiring for, for a cure? Find Why me a we, cure. Desperately well, find me a well, cure. Find basic science. But can't we do more than that? That's the sure. I think the question that's, is, is that it's got to be either or. He's not asking for 100%. He's just... <laughs> I would spend I every day um, on basic science and in particular beta cell dysfunction. I think it just, just makes the point I that think, when there's turned out to be really quiet. It <laughs> just, just makes the point this. that when there's very little to fight over, the, the, the fights are pretty intense. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I guess True. It, do, it does come to the overarching point here that a bit more cash in the till will mean that um, people can actually feel a bit more secure and get on and start doing some interesting things. We certainly always forget about health systems, how you implement, how, why, you know, why are people, you know, we know how to manage risk factors and people aren't having it done. Why aren't GPs doing it? Why aren't people asking for it? You know, that will be transformative in its own right until you get Absolutely. a theory. Because but, the cost for diabetes management is from the hospitalizations and, you know, yeah. And the publication, so it's, it's you can't ignore it. So, like, I mean, you can't, you just can't ignore that. So, can but, I just say that while we're all arguing, and when I say we, I mean you, not me. <laughs> while we're all arguing, researchers are all arguing about it. We need to remember that one, this doesn't, it's not a good look for people with diabetes because I really don't want to think that there's all this fighting. You should be in your labs doing things or doing your behavioural research or doing whatever it is that you're doing. Um, but. The frustration is obviously very real for you all. It's very real for us as well because I think sometimes we have been, you know, people with diabetes, I was diagnosed in 1998 and I was told there was going to be a cure in five years, 10 yeah. at the most. Where is my cure? Um, you know, so there, there is that, that frustration is felt by those of us living with it every day as well. That is actually the fault of that organisations endo? like JDRF that were pushing that theme already well before 98 
when I was starting, they were also talking about five to 10 years because it's a great way to raise money for the thing, but it's not fair on the patients. I've heard Kellyan medalists who have had diabetes for 60 plus years, longer than any organisation that was around, but was being told the same thing. This They're being to... told, but you yeah. don't have to believe everything you're told. We have... But when you're newly diagnosed, no, you have it. this hope and it's this coming from the health professional. JDRF, if I could just be clear. No, what I'm saying to you I is... I work for them, so I'm, I'm not... You know. What I'm saying to you is... I get very disappointed when people walk into my office. They say, I've been to some symposium and they said there'll be a cure in five years. Why haven't you got it? And I'm, it puts me on the back foot because I say, look, we never know when we're going to cure things. To be honest, I don't think it was an unreasonable point of view of the JDRF and other organisations when they saw all these autoimmune diseases like rheumatoid, colitis, Multiple sclerosis did very well mm. with all the new drugs. We wouldn't have expected the type 1 diabetes would not have been in that club. Yep. And in retrospect, maybe we were too naive. Maybe we didn't understand enough. That's where SOPS points were important, that you need to do the basic research in type 1 diabetes to work out why type 1 diabetes wasn't at least cured by these great drugs 10 years ago. There is some hope now with some new drugs that yeah. Don knows more about. But it has been a bit disappointing. So I think there was some hope. But the pumps are delivering a lot more than everyone was hoping 10 or 20 there years ago. There is so much hope. There so is I still mean, hope, but there, but there is still frustration. And that I can tell point. you, when I worked, Ella and I work in diabetic kidney disease, when I started in diabetic kidney disease, it was just a rapidly progressive disease. They were all in renal failure in three to five years. That is exceptionally rare now. And it's not been from some amazing discovery. It's a range of incremental discoveries that have all been added and have transformed the situation. So there's no question research delivers. Yeah. And it's not just in diabetes, but in many other disorders. But that's, that's, where the, that's where, if you're talking about incremental, that's why you need all the yeah, other basic research. Exactly. You say, basic research, you know, you just can't. They're all it. actually basic yeah. incremental. Research. Well, yes. <laughs> <laughs> No, I think time is up. Oh. I think we've had a red hot go problems with strategy, well. and I think that we're, uh, you know, this is a conversation in family, but you need to get your act together to actually push forward on a, on a yeah, yeah. platform for arguing for that. And, the you know, the people are there to do it. It's not dead. It's just not in great shape at the moment. So, but uh, thank you all very much. Continue on. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Norman, and thank you, panellists. We said this week we were going to spark Australia's biggest conversation about the impact of diabetes in Australia. I think we're surely doing that. I'm going to throw my notes away for a little bit and just talk. We are a united community and we do have a groundswell. We have outstanding companies who work tirelessly day in, day out to change the future for all Australians. I stand strongly with JDRF. I stand strongly with the ADF, Diabetes Victoria, ADA, Arcady, ACBRD. Together, we are doing incredibly powerful work every single day. It is needle moving, but we need collectively more funding. I hear words from this group as I was growing up as a researcher, JDRF were there for me. Diabetes Australia were there for me. Guess what? We're still there for you. The CEO of JDRF, Mike Wilson, myself, and the CEOs of the other organisations that um, I've mentioned, we work together every single day. We are collectively raising the voice. We are doing it every single day. I want to reiterate, nobody chooses diabetes. Nobody. The thing that I have loved out of this debate is something new that I haven't heard in the last 18 months since I've been in this role. It's no longer hearing competitions about different types of diabetes, GDM, type 1, type 2, LADA, MODI. It's I'm hearing the diabetes community needs more research funding. I'm hearing we want to work together. I am hearing that this matters are the largest conversation, the groundswell. Together, we can do this. Philanthropists want to give us money. 
We need to give them the story. And collectively, we are working to achieve that. We know that better funding is absolutely critical. I thank you all very, very, very much. And what I wanna to say to all our online viewers and to all the people who perhaps do not know our community as well as um, some of us in the room do, we do genuinely stand together. What we wanted was a robust discussion. My only wish, and next time we do it, we will, I will make absolutely sure that Mike Wilson and JD are in the room as well, because they are absolutely key and outstanding part of all of this. And we look forward to the next round um, of discussions and you hearing a lot, lot, lot more from all of us. Um, we have a national consultation survey out at the moment, which will feed into the Australian government's parliamentary inquiry into diabetes. In the last two and a half days, we've already got over 3,000 comments coming in. There will be more coming. I'm incredibly grateful for your time. I'm grateful for your passion. Um, and for those of you who'd like more, tomorrow night we'll be in Sydney to discuss the obesity crisis. Is there a magic pill? On Thursday, we're then going to move to Adelaide and talk about type two diabetes remission before wrapping up the week with an online only debate about access to technology treatments and to tech. Thank you, thank you for all of your involvement. Have a great evening. We appreciate your time and we appreciate your passion for making a difference to change lives. Thank you.